Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Now, we've all spoken to small children, and usually one of the first questions we'll ask a child, how old are you? And it doesn't matter what country that you happen to be in, a child will always answer in the same way. They'll say four and a half or six and a half. Now, what does that say? It says that they are looking forward to being a year older. That is to say that they want to mature. And we can learn something from children because we as believers, we should want to grow and mature and be individuals that measure up to adulthood in the spirit. That is to be like our heavenly father, God Almighty. And that's what we're called to be like. Now, we don't become divine, but we are called to be holy. Well, growing and maturing in the faith is what we're going to be talking about today. So take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Ephesians and chapter 4. The book of Ephesians and chapter 4. Now, Paul is speaking, and notice how he begins this chapter, verse 1. I beseech you, and notice how he identifies himself. Not by name, he says, the bond servant in the Lord. See, I believe that Paul wanted to emphasize as a mature believer, as a leader, that he wasn't elevating himself, but he understood that he was a servant. A servant, and this term means one who has been purchased, one who is indebted. So Paul wants to share with us the fact that we are purchased by the blood of Messiah and we are indebted to him. Now, notice something else. I beseech you, I, the bondservant in the Lord, and what is he beseeching? And this is a strong word. It shows something that is very important. He says that you might walk in a worthy manner. Now, Greek is a very precise language. No matter what the order is of the words, we can see what is the subject, what is the verb, what's the direct object. So word order doesn't tell us necessarily, you know, what part of speech do we have, but it tells us what's emphasized, what's important. And here, the first word that he says in that second sentence is the word worthy, that we're supposed to walk in a worthy manner. And that word doesn't just mean worthy, but it can also mean appropriate. That is that we should walk in an appropriate manner. To what? Well, keep reading. To the calling by which we have been called. Now, let's stop for a moment. I want to emphasize, and we're going to see this four times in this passage. We are going to see that, that there's a call placed upon us. And why is that so important? Because many times people simply say, yes, I want to accept the gospel. I want to be a believer. I want all the benefits of being a child of God. But the problem is this. They don't think about the call upon their life. So we read here, and this is very important that we see, that we have been called by a calling. One of the important aspects of a child of God is this. Not only when we die are we going to be in the kingdom of God, that we're saved, that we're redeemed. But also, we need to see that there's a call placed upon us for this age, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, And this goes back to what we're talking about, about being mature and growing and reaching the full stature of a true believer. So let's press on to verse 2. The question is, well, oftentimes people don't understand this calling. And in, our, in actuality, we need to have it revealed to us. Now, why do I say that? Well, look at verse 2. There is some things that help us hear from God. That is to understand that specific, that individual call upon our life. And that's why he says, verse 2, 
with all humility and this next word is a word for silence or, or quietness. And that's important because in order to be humble, we shouldn't draw attention to ourselves. This word for quietness or being still is a word that says that I don't need to be the center of attention. I'm not trying to get people to notice me and look up to me. Rather, humility. And therefore, it says here, in all humility and quietness with long suffering. Now, that means patience. See, you will never grow. You will never mature. You're not going to position yourself by which you can hear from God what He is calling you to do individually unless you learn this special truth about being patient, waiting and enduring things for God to communicate His truth. And then finally it says, bearing with one another, or simply bearing one another, and here's a key, that familiar word that Paul always comes back to, and we'll see it many times here, this concept of love. Bearing one another with love. Now, here's a very important truth about love. Love, this word in the biblical language, has to do with giving. It has to do with sacrifice. Why do I say that? Well, you know that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave, that is, he sacrificed. So what I want you to see here is this. When we have endurance, patience, when we're willing to suffer long, endure things, and our motivation is love, what is that? Not ourselves, but what is best. Now, here's an important truth. When we're behaving in love, it does not mean that we do what someone else wants. No, it's in love. You know, we don't have any scripture where, where Israel called God, God, send your son into the world. But out of love, he did what was best for his, his people. And not just for Israel, but it says, for he so loved the world that he gave. So this is an important truth for us. And this is all about, and we'll see it develop in a few minutes, it is all about the person growing, maturing, reaching that full measure of what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Messiah Yeshua. So these things are important. Move on to verse 3. He says, striving to keep the unity, and in this fourth chapter, especially this first section that we're going to learn today, we're going to see that several times this word unity appears. And unity is a precious thing. When we were learning in uh, uh, the book of Jonah, we, we talked about for a moment this, this incident that happened all the way back in the book of, of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 11, that Tower of Babel, where God confused the languages so the people would not have togetherness. They could not communicate. So we find here that communication and, and unity go hand in hand. And how are we going to be able to communicate and have unity? Well, that's what he's going to reveal right here. Look again at verse 3. Striving or enduring, however you want to translate that word, to keep the unity of the Spirit in which we are bound of peace. Now, it's that same word in a different form. But same word that Paul, when he says, I am a bondservant of the Lord, it's the same idea of being a servant or in bondage to peace. Now, bondage, we may hear that and we think of a negative thing. But what it has to do with is God keeping us in what? Peace. And understand something about peace. Peace, and we've mentioned this many times, peace is not simply the absence of problems or conflict or violence, but peace is the fulfillment of God's will. So when we have a desire for, for the will of God, we are going to endure, we are going to be humble, we are going to be quiet, we are going to act in love. That is, we are going to think, what is the best for this other individual? What can I do to him, for him, how can I assist him in love that the will of God might be realized in his life because there's nothing better than God's plans and his purposes. Well, move on to verse 4. Now, in verse 4, we're going to see, we've been talking about unity, 
We've been talking about a true peace. And the word that's going to appear over and over in the next few verses is this word one. Now, why is that the case? Because one speaks of unity. Also in the scripture, one speaks of God. So unless we're submitting to him, unless we're hearing from him, unless we are worshiping him, we're not going to have that oneness. God's not going to be actively present in our life. He'll be there. He promises never to leave us nor forsake us, but we're not going to be a recipient of his, his ministry to us to, to empower us and equip us for what he has called us to do. Unity is a necessity for that. Verse, verse 4, he says, there is one body and one spirit. Now, what I want you to see here is this body, this is the body of believers. And he says there's one spirit, that is the spirit of God. Yes, he works in the individual, but he does so for a collective purpose. So that's why it says one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Now, here's again this, this emphasis on calling. And there's a relationship here in the text in verse 4 between hope and calling. Now, what is that call? Well, we need to see it in two, two manifestations. First of all, there's that general call. What God wants His people, what people, all of His people, all followers to do. How we conduct our life, this character, and we're going to talk about, and we have before, this character of the kingdom whereby we just demonstrate the attributes, we, we behave according to the mind of Messiah, all that in a general sense. But as I've alluded to earlier, there's that individual call. That is to say, what God wants to do with our life as an individual. How do we serve? What He wants us to do. And, and the hope of that call is all rooted in what? When you are unified with the purposes of God. So look at that verse again, verse 4. He says, One body, one spirit, just as you have been called with one hope of that call. And this idea of hope, well, it's rooted in the promises of God. So what he's saying is this. God, we know he has numerous promises throughout this, this book. And what I want you to see is this. It is only when we respond to that general call, the attributes, the character that every believer should have, doing the various things, the, the Word of God, obeying His commands, then we're going to grow and mature. And an outcome of this maturity is that God is going to begin to reveal His specific purposes, how God wants you to live out through this, this general call. It begins with the general, and then it gets more specific. So oftentimes, believers, they are frustrated. They feel empty. They're confused about things because they have not began that general work, the call upon each believer, and because they have not submitted to that, because they are not rooted and grounded in love for others, as Messiah's character demands because of that, they're not hearing what God individually wants them to do. And therefore, they're confused, they're frustrated, they grow empty in their, their walk with the Lord. Well, let's press on to verse, verse 5. Verse 5 speaks about, once again, this unity, this, this absoluteness. He says, look at verse 5, there is one Lord and one faith. Now, faith has to do with truth, and what we find is the Lord, He is the author of truth. It is not what I think seems right. It is not what makes sense in my mind. It's what God has explicitly revealed in His Word. And notice it doesn't say here there is one God, that there is one Creator, but He says there is one Lord, or that word is Master. So if we want that unity, there's a degree of submissiveness Look on, verse 4, excuse me, verse 5. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, baptism, why do you think that he speaks about baptism? Well, baptism, it is a preparation for service. Why do I say that? And many people think this baptism is something that's uniquely related to the New Testament. 
that until John the Baptist came on the scene, there was no uh, immersion. That is totally false. We, we see that before a priest or a Levite would serve in the Mishkan, the tabernacle, or in the Bet HaMikdash in the temple, prior to their service, they would be immersed. So it is a change of status. And what is the origin of that chat status change? Well, think back to when Messiah came to the Jordan River and he was immersed by John. Now, it was not an immersion for him of repentance. Why? Messiah never needed to repent. For us, it is. What Messiah was saying when he was immersed, he was saying that he is going to go to Jerusalem and fulfill his heavenly Father's plan for his life. That is to say, he was saying, I'm going to submit to the will of God. And what the Scripture is saying is this. There is one Lord, there is one truth, there is one faith, in other words, and we need to what? Submit to it. We need to understand the necessity of being prepared to serve God. So that's what he's talking about in verse 5. Let's move on to verse, verse 6. Now, instead of saying there's one Lord, he writes, there is one God. And God, this is this supreme authority. And what I want you to see here is God is also uh, synonymous with creator. How did God create things? He just spoke. And this goes back to his authority, his power. So this God, there's one, and we need to, to identify him, submit to him, serve him, hear from him. So we read verse 6, there is one God and Father, that is, Father is seen biblically provider. There is one source of provision. There is only one place that we can turn to to find what is required, what is necessary to live a life of obedience. When I say obedience, another way that we can say that is a life which is praiseworthy. And that should be our objective. And the only way to do that is when we imitate, and we'll see this in a few minutes, when we imitate Messiah himself. So one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So absolute. He is sovereign. In Hebrew, we talk about Ribbono Shaolam, the master of the world, the creator of the world, that everything is subjected to him. Verse, verse 7. Now, in speaking about this, we find ourselves in a position where, in and of ourselves, left to ourselves, we're unable to carry this out. We are in need of what begins that process of the call and the equipping of the saints. And what is that? Verse 7. And to each one, grace was given. Now, here again. Paul likes the word love. He uses it often. He likes the word grace. He uses it frequently. And, of course, there's a relationship between them. It was because of God's perfect love that he gave. What did he give? He gave his grace. And grace, this word in Hebrew is the word chesed, and it's always tied to a covenant. Covenant associated with promises. So God gives grace in order that his promises might be realized in our life, that we could be the recipient of those promises. So look again, verse, verse 7. And to each one he has given grace according to the measure of the gift of, of Messiah. Now, notice when he says measure, what he's talking about, this idea of measure is what was needed. It's not saying that he gave uh, some to, to others and less to, to others. No, it's talking about sufficiency, that he gave grace according to the measure of the gift of Messiah. The real purpose of this phrase is to let us know that the only place where the grace of God is, is available is through the gift of Messiah. Look on at verse 8. Therefore it says, and this means he's going to quote a scripture. Therefore it says, he went up to, to high, the very heights. Now this is related to the fact we could turn, for example, to Philippians chapter 2 and, and read about the fact that because Messiah Yeshua emptied himself, he obeyed even to death, death on that, that cross. 
and God had given to him the name above all names. So he was exalted to the various heights. No one has achieved a greaterness than Messiah Yeshua. And because of that, notice what he's done. He's used that greatness for one purpose. What is that? Look again, middle of verse 8. We read, and he ascended up on high, and he took captivity captive. Now, what is that about? Took captivity captive. Well, in the place known as Sheol. Sheol is the place for the dead. We talked about that in our study of the book of Jonah. We know from the new covenant, when Messiah told this account of Lazarus and the rich man, we learned that there is two specific compartments in Sheol, a place known as, as Hades or hell, a place of torment, and a place called Abraham's bosom. Those who had the faith of Abraham, that's where they went. Today, there is no more Abraham's bosom. Why? Well, look at this verse. In verse 8, it says, He took captivity captive. That is, he emptied out Abraham's bosom. He took them to heaven. And I want you to see that he did something. For those who have that same faith, that faith in the covenant promises of God, that faith that we know Abraham's covenant is rooted in Messiah Yeshua. He is the source. He is the, the point of it. What did he do? He gives gifts to mankind. That is, it's only through Messiah's work of taking captivity captive. Where were we captive in? Well, captivity by the, the bondage of sin. He, he set us free from that. We should be heavenly minded. Paul says elsewhere, he says, consider yourself seated in the, the heavenly places. Think a heavenly matter. So he says, he took captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Verse 9. Now, for us to understand this, he wants to clarify it. He says, the one who went up is that same one that went down. That's what it means. The one doesn't ascend unless first he, he went down, where? Into the lower parts of the earth. That's that Sheol, that place formerly where, where the dead went. Now, if you are a believer, you escape Sheol. There is no Abraham's bosom. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So what happens? Well, we read, he, he, he descended. What does that mean? First he went down and then he rose up and he, he did something. Look at verse 10. This is the same one who went down. He is the one that went up over all things. That is, he is preeminent. He has absolute superiority. Now he went up over all things of the heaven. Why? Why did he go down for the purpose, and we'll see this in a moment, of redemption? That's what he took captivity captive. He took ownership, and this is inherently related to, to redemption. So verse 11, this same one went down, right? He went down, he, he ascended above all things in heaven in order that he might fill all things. Fill things, all things with what? Everything that we need to walk with God. Everything that we need to manifest the glory of God. Everything that we need to be faithful, to grow, to mature, and as we'll see, to grow into the full stature of an adult, a mature believer. Look at verse 11. Now, in verse 11, he's going to talk about service. Why? Well, the reason that we have been saved, remember that call upon our life. So he says here, there's different callings. Look at verse 11. He gave some to be apostles, others to be prophets, and still others to be evangelists, and still others to be pastors and teachers. Now, according to the Greek grammar, there is a relationship, a connection between pastor and teacher. We would conclude from this, we're talking about one task, one calling, where apostles and prophets and, and so forth, evangelists, specifically different calls. But, but pastor-teacher is one and the same. Why is that so important? Well, simply because if you're going to protect someone, and that's what a pastor does, if you're going to nourish them, what do we nourish people with? The Word of God. How do we do that? By teaching truth. And that's why it says pastors, teachers. And it says, for the equipping of the saints, 
for the works of ministry, for the edification of the body of Messiah. So he speaks edification. He speaks about growing and maturing in the faith. For the edification of the body of Messiah, his presence, his work in this world through his followers. And then press on, if you would, to verse 13. In order that we might arrive, who? That all, and the context here is all believers. That we might arrive, don't miss this, that we might arrive to the full stature, this is what we were talking about, the full stature of Messiah. That's what we're called to be, like Him. Now, what I want you to see is that we have a great potential. But it's only when we begin to submit to that. How do we start? Remember that general calling. What does the Word of God tell believers to do? And we should search this and understand there is a blessing that comes from commandments. We've talked about the fact, we've learned that the biblical word in the Hebrew text for commandment also has in it the same idea of unity or togetherness or intimacy. So here's the key. It is only when I begin to respond to the Word of God that I take hold of the commandments and realize there's just not commandments in the first five books of the Bible, the, the Torah. There are commandments throughout the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant is full of commandments. In fact, one of the important things we see, and we'll see this in the next lesson, is the importance of obedience. Obedience to what? The Word of God, that we might submit. And as I said, it is only when we begin to submit to these general things that He calls all believers to do. It is through that that we begin to hear from God. And God begins to direct our paths in a very personal way, what He specifically wants us to do. And that's why He talks about in verse 13 that we might be a, a, a good person. No. He says here, more than that, that we might grow into a perfect man, into the full measure and stature of Messiah. And that's why the body of believers is not just called an ecclesia, those who are called out, but we're called the body of Messiah, that we might represent Him in this world. And it's only when we take on that call in love that we're going to see the work and anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit being released in our lives. Well, I'm out of time until next week when we carry on in Ephesians chapter 4. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.